So welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining me today at the Parents and Partners Conference. Uh, today we're going to be talking a little bit about sexual health and uh, sexual health education actually for people with intellectual disabilities. Let's make sure our screen can work. Oh, there we go. And there's a list of our sponsors, which I'm sure you've seen a few times already. Let me just adjust this light. I'm so sorry. So my name is Tracy O'Regan. Um, I'm titled, my professional title is Inclusion Coordinator and Education Liaison. I work for an agency called uh, Community Living Toronto. We'll talk a little bit about that a little bit more later. Um, there's my email address if you're interested in reaching out to me after this presentation. Um, and we'll get started. So there's me. I go by the she and her pronouns. And so Community Living Toronto. Community Living Toronto is an agency that supports people with intellectual disabilities. And I've had the privilege of working with them for, oh my gosh, it's been almost 31 years now. Um, it's, it's, it's an interesting field. Uh, Community Living Toronto actually offers um, services for people with intellectual disabilities in a variety of capacities. We run group homes, we have day programs, um, recreational opportunities, but my role falls into what's called community support. And for the last over 20 years of the 30 years I've worked there, my job has been to provide support to families and individuals with intellectual disabilities who actually live in the community. So not in our core services like group homes, but more um, people that live either independently in the community or with family members. You'll see uh, from this slide that uh, Community Living Toronto believes that is a society should be where everyone belongs and everyone is valued. And that really encompasses everything that we do um, at our agency and within community support. We believe in community, choice and integrity. And that's something we'll talk a little bit more about as you, we go forward in the presentation. So today, what I hope you can take away with you uh, once we finish is I, I'm hoping that you'll be able to define what is sexual health. There's a lot of questions around what sexual health education is and um, people come from it from all different perspectives. But I want you to, I'm going to provide you with a definition that uh, leads the way I do my work with around sexual health and people with intellectual disabilities. And I hope that you'll understand a bit more about um, how important it is for people who, um, uh, for people who, um, for people who, uh, sorry about that, I just wanted to mute that person, I, I, I was getting distracted. Uh, for people who are labeled with the with intellectual disability. I also want you to better understand the unique challenges of providing meaningful sexual health education for people with intellectual disabilities. The key word here is meaningful. Um, a lot of times, um, much of the education is, is very rudimentary and uh, it doesn't actually serve the needs of the people that Community Living Toronto and myself support. And then I want to um, provide you with an example of a program that we've created at Community Living Toronto, one that I've been running for approximately 15 years now, and it's called the Relationship in You program. And hopefully uh, it might be a program that you might think may benefit you, uh, your children, and your students if there's educators in the audience. So just to take a minute, and I know we're a little um, behind here, but I want you to think back to what comes to mind when you think of sexual health education. Do you think, think back to maybe if you had the privilege of having any sexual health education in um, schools or maybe a family member or one of your children, just take a moment to think a little bit about what comes to mind when you do sexual health education. These are three words that come up a lot, a lot when I'm discussing uh, sexual health education with people. People think of puberty, pregnancy, sexually transmitted infections. In other words, people really think about things that are more clinical, I guess we could say. 
I don't know if this is your experience, but this was definitely my experience growing up. Um, I'm a parent of two children. I have an 18 year old and a 12 year old and just seeing the change in sexual health education that's provided at schools just in the six year span of my two children it's very interesting how there has been a shift a bit of a shift from this more clinical talk like puberty pregnancy um, and very medicalized kind of form of education to what my younger son is experiencing now which is more in line with what i hope to provide to community members so there's many definitions around sexual health education. I like to look at the World Health Organization's definition um, strictly because it's international. It is not just uh, a locally based um, definition. Um, it's, it's, it's one that people around the world can respond to or um, have access to. And I find that a lot of sexual health educators um, do, do use this um, definition more to guide the work that they do in the community. So first of all, World Health Organization defines health. So there's two words to it, sexual and health education. So they define health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. In other words, you know, just because one may not be sick at the moment or suffering maybe from a mental illness or some other kind of um, illness doesn't mean that they're necessarily in a place of well-being, okay? It's, very, it's a very interesting distinction. They also define, the World Health Organization also defines sexuality as a central aspect of being human throughout life. So sexuality is just, um, it's a normal human response. It's a typical human response. Um, but we'll see later on how, even though it is a typical response, people come at it from many different perspectives. But they also define sexual health as a state of physical, emotional, mental, and social well-being in relation to sexuality that requires a positive and respectful approach to sexuality and sexual relationships free of coercion, discrimination, and violence. So they go on to expand it a little bit more. And so in other words, sexuality is not just about what our body does and what we do with our bodies. It's more than just the medical. It's more than just the physical. It is influenced by our attitudes, our values, societal values, family values, religious values. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's about the way we express and experience sexuality within those value confines. Sexuality does not take place in a vacuum. I mean, I think most of us, um, many of us know this, um, but it's always good to, to remind ourselves um, that sexuality is shaped by those things around us, whether it's biological, psychological, economic, um, issues, religious, you know, values, spiritual factors. There's a lot of things that influence how we experience our sexuality and how we express our sexuality. Some of those things we have control over and some we have less control over. And this becomes really important, especially for the people who identify as having an intellectual disability. There, we'll find out a little bit later that there's more, um, constraints coming from external people than there are from them themselves. So sexual health education is also about social justice. So having access to appropriate sexual health education helps dismantle gender inequity, sorry, sexual violence prevention, sexism, homophobia, racism, ageism, ableism, and we can go on. Um, and the reason it, it has that influence on social justice issues is that the more we talk about sexual health and the things that it encompasses, the more we start to have a conversation about those other things that may be influencing us. So for instance, if we start to learn a bit more about this different sexual orientations, let's say gay or lesbian, um, it brings up conversations about what could be the inequities people who identify as being gay or lesbian 
um, may have. And it helps us to dismantle and those kind of issues in society, which might be affecting the way we're able to experience and express our sexuality. About 15 years ago, 10 or 15 years ago, it was, it was kind of a fluid process. From my work working with families, I started to understand and listen to them and hear their concerns about um, opportunities that they wanted for their children, uh, whether they be very young children at that time or even adult children. And many of the things that came up was about relationships. Relationships are a variety of ways. We can experience relationships in a variety of ways, and we'll, we'll delve a bit into that a little more. Um, but as the family members talked about their loved ones, their children, um, and sometimes siblings, because sometimes I would meet and work with siblings, I started to understand that there was a feeling of social exclusion. These families felt their children and they themselves had been socially exclu excluded because their children had been labeled with an intellectual disability. Putting that together with my interest in sexual health education, I wanted to talk to individuals who were over 18, um, who may or may not be living with family members. So some of them were living in communities. And I wanted to better understand what they wanted, what they identified as being the barriers for themselves to participate in their communities. And the three main themes that came up were they expressed that they wanted relationships, whatever that looked like. They wanted to make choices and they wanted to decide what help they needed. And we'll go into those in a little more depth. So with regards to wanting relationships, it's, it, relationships are a very interesting, um, people have very different point of views of what a relationship is. I know when I approached the work and started my interviews with these individuals, I was thinking more of intimate relationships. And what they clearly said to me, very clearly uh, and quickly, which I appreciated, um, was that relationships were more than just about intimacy. Um, for them, relationships encompassed a variety of associations, including platonic friendships, sexual and intimate partnerships, their family relationships, and relationships that they made through either volunteer employment experiences or just being part of their community. And they wanted to choose what relationships they had access to. For many of them, they expressed that they had been guided or even maybe sometimes forcibly pushed into developing certain relationships that they had no interest in. And they really wanted to get the point across that they want relationships, but they want them to be of their choosing. So in other words, they wanted to make choices. They expressed quite clearly that they wanted to make mistakes. They wanted to experience what we call dignity of risk. They knew that, you know, sometimes they were, you know, they may get hurt. Um, or sometimes, you know, things may not work out as well as we always hope, but they wanted the ability to learn from those mistakes. They didn't want to be uh, kept in a protective barrier. They wanted to also have access to resources and supportive guidance. What they found was that many times when they try to seek out supports, um, either by trusted adults or by community partners or um, by schools or even within their own families, they found that the, the advice they were given and, um, and the resources they had access to were always censored. And they wanted to make sure that they had as much information as they could to make the choices that they wanted for themselves. They wanted to decide what help they would need. I mean, it may sound, um, as a, and I come from this as a, as a person that has worked to support people with intellectual disabilities, so otherwise known as you know, a staff member. I thought it was really, um, it was eye-opening for me and in my work that um, they wanted supports that they chose. So often supports are presented to people, especially with intellectual disabilities, as this is what it, th there is and uh, you take it or you leave it. 
there was no reaching out to them to really decide if the resources that were available were um, supportive in doing what they were supposed to. And so they really made it clear to me at that time that they wanted uh, a variety of supports. Um, a support that was good enough for them maybe when they were 12 was not the same when they were 18 or 25. I've worked with individuals that have been almost 60 years old, and again, they're saying the same thing, that some of the supports uh, that they're presented um, as, as a senior in our society are very childlike and uh, really do not encompass their lived experience or um, what their actual needs are. They also wanted access to inclusive opportunities. They expressed this very quite clearly. And this is, this is really embedded in the work that Community Living Toronto does and the work that I've always done. Um, they didn't want to be segregated. They didn't want to always have specialized resources. And they didn't want any resource just to be framed because they had an intellectual disability. Not saying that those supports aren't important at some points in their lives, um, and we all access, you know, specialized supports, but they found that their ability to access what we would call more inclusive opportunities or supports and opportunities that are available to um, neurotypical people um, was not always available to them. And they were going to decide um, that this was not always suitable and they would like more access to those supports that all of us enjoy. So the key message that um, I got out of the interviews and, and then speaking with families, and I also broadened the scope of this research. I also spoke with many different agencies who provide supports with people with intellectual disabilities. And it became really apparent um, talking with all those stakeholders that what the, the, the key message was that re relationships define us, right? And people with intellectual disabilities, they recognize that having strong relationships of their choosing within their communities is an indication of their position in society. And they realized, or what they made it more apparent to me was that because they've been denied access to develop a variety of different relationships, they were considered less than, they weren't considered um, as, um, contributing members of society. They weren't contrib they, they weren't, they thought they weren't um, considered worthy. And so they really defined for me that they need more access to developing relationships and that I as a support person and I as a representative of community in Toronto um, should make this a priority. And so that's what we started to do. And we started to talk a lot about um, around um, sexual health education for people with intellectual disabilities as part of expanding their ability to develop relationships. But what came apparent at that time was they have unique challenges. For instance, social exclusion, going through all the research and talking with, with the, the stakeholders, it became very apparent um, that they felt extremely socially excluded. We all know that social exclusion does have a negative impact on people's well-being and denies them the right to fulfill their potential and contribute to their communities. We also know that people who are socially excluded are more likely to experience poor physical and mental health loneliness, isolation, and poor self-esteem. And this was very um, apparent in the people that I was interviewing for my research and the families um, when they were expressing, you know, what they wanted for their children, that not only were their children socially excluded because they had been labeled with an intellectual disability, but they as family members were also excluded. No longer could they access supports as well as maybe their neighbors or even their family members that their child's disability had a negative impact on their um, ability to participate in the community as well. A particular challenge for these people just more clearly outlined it is 
that they experience life differently. They may experience life differently, but they share the similar needs. And this always stuck out to me as well. There was a very long conversation about uh, the term special needs and how offensive some of these adults who had been living with a label um, for, for, their, for, for their entire lives, how they felt that their needs weren't special. And that when people gave them that label as having special needs, they found it almost offensive because what it did for them was it created them as the other. So for instance, what they pointed out to me is they have the same needs as everyone else. They need to go to school. They need access to medical care. They need access to recreational opportunities. They need access to their communities. How they may access those may be a challenge uh, and they may, may need a particular support to do so, but that their needs were the same as everybody else. They also mentioned that they have lack, lack access to activities they prefer or desire. And here, this is what I was mentioning earlier. Many times um, these individuals expressed that they had, you know, wanted to join, let's say, a painting club or a hiking group or whatever the activity was that they wanted. And what they felt was that most people try to push them into maybe a segregated kind of program. So it would be more of grouping people just based on the fact that they had a disability and not based on the fact that they um, actually shared a love of something. Um, you know, there was a group that mentioned, you know, we would hang out in this hangout, um, but we didn't want to hang out with the people that were there. They also found it very offensive that for many of them, um, as even as adults, they found themselves grouped into programs with very younger children. Um, and that said a lot to them. It really did that, that their lives as, pe as having an intellectual disability was almost like people were looking at them like they were children. So they made it very, very clear that they wanted to um, choose programs um, and community access based on their preferences and not based on their disability. When it comes to sexual health, um, when I delve more deeper into the research um, in the community and with these people that were good enough to participate, I started to realize something else. Um, they informed me that many of them were actually denied the tools, and I mean denied the tools to participate and learn more about what it meant to be in safe um, and healthy sexual relationships. For some of them, they did share with me that even during school, um, certain topics were not presented to them, even though they were presented to the larger um, student population. It was almost felt that they wouldn't be able to understand or they wouldn't be able to appreciate it. Um, or there was also um, ideas around, well, they'll never be sexual um, or be in a sexual relationship, meaning the physical sexual relationship, and therefore didn't need access to the information. And they expressed to me how detrimental this was to their ability to establish relationships, their ability to establish especially sexual relationships, because they did not have the same knowledge as their peers. One other thing that became very apparent too was, and this is the third point down the slide, that many of the people um, that I supported uh, in the past and that Community Living Toronto supports now have been taught to be compliant and they therefore may not know their rights um, when it comes to sexuality. And they also need consent education um, and that consent education goes beyond sexual health. There's many times they express that, you know, as a person with an intellectual disability, whenever they would try to express their needs um, or express dis, uh, displeasure with what they were provided for, they were considered what's called, um, a, it became a behavioral issue. Instead of really trying to understand what was, um, what was happening and what they were trying to advocate for, they were told to be compliant and compliancy can be very dangerous, especially for people with intellectual disabilities, especially when we know that um, many individuals that are supported by Community Living Toronto and other agencies in the community 
um, have a very much higher risk of experiencing sex sexual abuse because they're unable to express boundaries. They haven't been given the opportunity to, to be taught um, issues of consent and self boundaries, and therefore it's putting them in harm's way. So I was very mindful of that when we discussed and decided to create a program around sexual health education. So what we came up with, um, and I say we, it was myself and a master's student of education actually that I was supervising. After interviewing and going through all the uh, research material from our interviews, we decided to create a program um, or not a learning opportunity. I don't even know if I like the word program, uh, a learning opportunity for people who identify with having an intellectual disability. We decided to call it Relationships in You. And there's a reason we did that. It was very intentional. Although our, when we started, it was um, our main goal was to provide you know, appropriate um, sexual health education we started to realize that that was too narrow, that we needed to provide um, some tools and information that would help people with intellectual disabilities feel less excluded and to give them tools to participate in their communities um, as fully as they wanted to um, and teach them how to advocate for themselves. And so in our program, um, what we do is we focus on the word relationships, because everything that we do is a relationship. Um, the minute you and I go out to a store, there's a relationship between um, as consumers. If we go, let's say, on the TTC, we now have a relationship with the other people, the other passengers on the bus. We have a relationship with the driver of the bus. Everything we do is about relationships. And so what we decided was we were gonna divide um, our workshop into uh, about eight categories. And I say about eight um, because it's very, very fluid. The first thing that we do whenever we're um, getting involved in, in putting on this program is it's, it's, it, of the most utmost essence to make sure that we interview those who are interested. We do this for a variety of reasons, um, just like teachers will, you know, meet with students to, and parents to, to find out what's the best accommodations in an IEP, let's say. We do the same thing as well. So when I've been asked to do this at TDSB schools or the Catholic board schools, the first step is to meet with teachers, um, find out the needs of their students, and then I meet with the students themselves. I want to hear from them what they want to get out of this program. But there are certain, um, I would say, ideas that we make sure that we encompass. And the first one is about emerging adulthood. We talk about rights and responsibilities and what influences our choices. So for instance, values, our family values, our religious values, we don't make decisions in a vacuum and what we try to do is help people uh, explore why they may come to the certain decisions they do about the choices that they make. The other thing um, which is brought through and and I shouldn't these aren't like little lesson plans where we do adulthood and then we move on and etiquette and then we move on. These are just uh, themes and ideas that we bring into all the lessons that we do. So etiquette is um, one that can be quite hilarious to go through. Um, the first thing is explaining what we're talking about is manners and that there is different manners and different etiquette for different situations. Many times in my work, especially when I was working direct frontline supports, um, I would also often hear the phrase, oh, don't worry about that. You know, if someone was uh, maybe not going to, when they were going to the bathroom, they weren't closing the door, or maybe they were, you know, blowing their nose at the dinner table, those kind of things. And it was, there was almost, um, uh, and an excuse made for those people that, um, you know, don't worry about it, you know, they're just, they're just disabled. And I found that language extremely offensive, which I'm sure most of you would too, because it's, it's, it's saying that people with intellectual disabilities um, are childlike, and it's saying that people with intellectual disabilities don't have the capacity to learn. 
And what I found when I was interviewing many of the adults was that a lot of times they would find themselves in trouble. And this I did experience firsthand when I was providing actual coordination services for many individuals is that they would get into trouble um, either with the law um, or with members of their community because of the way they were behaving. And it became very apparent that they were never taught the different etiquette rules for the different types of relationships. Um, so it's something we focus a, a lot on throughout, throughout our program. A big thing for us is to make sure people I, I start to understand more about self-esteem and self-confidence, which are two different things. Um, as we go through it a little bit more, they start to understand that and can differentiate. But basically what we're talking about here is how do um, we perceive ourselves and how do others perceive us? So giving them um, an opportunity through activities to voice what they think of themselves and what they think, how they think others perceive them from um, acknowledging some of their lived experience. And again, of course, we talk about healthy relationships, uh, consent and choice. Consent and choice is talked about all the time. Um, and what it means to be in an unhealthy relationship and what it means to be in a healthy relationship um, about respecting uh, an individual's right to choose. Of course, we talk about human development. We do talk about the medical side. We talk biology, reproduction, sexual pleasure, orientation and identity, and the list goes on. We do spend a lot of time on those. And we make sure that it's age appropriate and we make sure um, for many students, especially if the ones, especially if I'm doing this for classroom students, um, this is something we discuss with parents as well, whose children might be part of the program. This is, I'm, I'm just gonna walk you through. Unfortunately, usually if we're in person, what happens is we do end up playing a couple of games, but we also set up, I tend to set up um, a table of all the resources that we, um, that we provide um, depending on the needs uh, of the students and the community members. And one of the games they like to play is called the relationship you, true or false. And just to get a sense, we won't go through the whole thing, but just to get a sense, what we do is we would show, let's say a picture like this and we would have a caption, have, you know, have the right to choose who you touch and who touches you. And it's a question and true or false. And it's really interesting. I mean, you know, of course, I think most of us would say, of course, right? That's true. We have the right to choose. Many of the people, um, and it doesn't surprise me anymore, it disappoints me, but it doesn't surprise me, say that they don't have the right to choose. And so just a simple question like this and a picture like this allows for a lot of discussion on um, how they um, feel that they have, you know, not m maybe as much ability to express their needs and wants and what might be interfering with that expression. And this picture is, is, goes back to a lot about what we were talking about um, with consent and choice, right? Something as simple as who touches you um, many of the people that I've supported and who have participated in the program have expressed to me that they don't feel that they have the right to do this. So it brings it, it, the small little picture and the small little statement brings in um, many concepts uh, for discussion. Another exciting game, and I know it doesn't look so exciting on a board when I look at it like this, but it's called the dating game. And as you see, um, you walk around the board and there's some, you know, interesting pictures uh, on the board and every color. So the red, red is the right for me, the gold, what if, the green, meet and greet, and the blue, loves me, loves me not, has a corresponding set of questions that come with it. And just as an example, just to show you what might happen if, you know, if you're a little, uh, um, if you're, we usually use money to go on the board um, to get away from that little sign of man or woman. Um, if you land on one of the spaces, this might be um, one of the questions that you might be confronted with. We allow um, whose ever turn it is to answer the question first, and then we allow others for extra points um, to maybe contribute to those answers as well. So one of the questions could be something like this. The person I want to ask out is the same gender as me. Is this person right for me? The person I want to ask out is the opposite gender as me. 
is this person right for me? And I think you can see from this question that this goes back to when we talked earlier about social justice and sexual health education. It starts to bring up um, a lot of conversations, not just about dating. Um, it brings up questions and discussion around gender identity. It brings up questions around homophobia. It brings up questions and statements around value statements and religious statements. And I find that sometimes um, the discussion can get a little heated because um, people are very passionate about their values and how they've been brought up. But it really also teaches people about compromise and it teaches people about empathy and thinking of others in the room, something that sometimes they have not themselves experienced. So it's not only allowing them to support their peers, um, but it's allowing them to develop those skills around empathy and uh, looking at things from a more social justice point of view. Another question, um, the person I want to ask out is a staff person. Is this person right for me? And the person I want to ask out already has a boyfriend or girlfriend. Is this person right for me? I like the top question in particular as a person who would be considered, I guess, a staff member. Um, and this could be an EA, an SNA, or it could be uh, a staff member in a group home, or even a camp counselor, all those kind of things. And a question like this, the person I want to ask out is a staff person, helps develop um, more, uh, broaden the discussion around consent and about abuse prevention. Although I don't try to approach my work um, with the stranger danger kind of model, I do want the people who participate in the program to be able to make informed choices. And it, a question such as going out with a staff member really shows, um, you know, it, it re-emphasizes that they have control over their bodies. It re-emphasizes that a staff person, a paid person is not a friend is not um is 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 there to do a job and to support you around a certain area but they're not considered a friend right and that if these are the only people that are around you which are staff people then maybe that's a point of um of looking around to develop um, other kind of friendships that are true friendships that you and i may experience This is another game. It used to be called, excuse me. Um, this is one that we use. It used to be called partner poker. And I, we don't usually use that title when we're playing it, especially with younger people. But if any of you have played poker, you kind of understand the, you know, um, some of the rules behind it. So this is a set of four questions. I know it's put on your screen. It looks like two big questions, but it, picture these in four. So when we play this game, people are handed five cards and together as a group or individually, um, we go through the cards that each person has been dealt. We call it the hand you've been dealt. And we look at the qualities as if this is a person that we may be interested in dating. And people go through it and, you know, they make a variety of choices. No, I don't want someone that's bossy or yes, I do want someone who likes to exercise or maybe I don't want someone who likes to exercise because I like sitting on the couch. Um, and when we play this game, you have an opportunity to get rid of three, hand, three of the cards and then you're given two more and, uh, and then you have to review those cards again and then you play it again and you can um, either discard one um, or none, or if you do decide to discard one, what happens is you get one more card and then the last five are the hand that you're dealt. And as we go through the different qualities, not only are the people that are participating in the game, which does bring out when I haven't showed all the pictures, but some pictures are quite hilarious, um, not only helps them understand different qualities, but it helps them understand what they would um, expect in a healthy relationship. And it helps them understand, again, what their values are and actually give words to those values. Um, it's a very interesting game. And if, if we were in person, you'd be playing it with me right at the moment, but we're not, so <laughs> we won't do that. Here's a particular card. So this is exactly what a card looks like, right? So you see that we use words for those individuals that can use words. 
Um, there are picture cues and other kind of picture cues for people that don't use, uh, do not um, read words. Um, but the question is, would you date this person? Would you date this person? And it makes fun of you. And, you know, the, um, the way they look at it is very interesting. Some people said, sure, because it means they have a great sense of humor. Where other people will say, no, that means they're mocking me. And so, again, it's all about the discussion. It's all about um, not necessarily, um, uh, you know, coming to the right decision for a group. It's coming to the decision that's right for you. This is one of the tools that we use a lot for uh, reproduction. As you can see, it's a little baby with an umbilical cord. Um, many people and, and uh, educators love this tool. Uh, we use this as part of um, our discussion about how babies are born. Uh, we use the proper language. And for those that um, may not benefit from pictures um, or from videos, actually holding um, something like this is is very helpful for them to have a better understanding of what we're talking about and this is the last thing that i'd like to present to you this is an incredible website it comes out of the states and it's all about sexual health education and this website is loaded loaded with tons of information for people with all um, different learning styles for all different ages. There's a special section, if any of you are educators, just for educators um, with uh, curriculum and toolkits and lesson plans. It's incredible. And for parents, there's a whole set of supports for parents to support their children with regards to sexual health education. And yesterday it didn't work. So hopefully cross your fingers, it will work today. This is just a sample of an introduction to what is a maze. Um, and I, I strongly suggest that you look into amaze.org and, and watch some of their videos. Uh, they have videos on puberty, masturbation, uh, anxiety, mental health, um, all kinds of things, birth control, a variety, a variety. And they're all, um, made for different levels. They're actually um, structured. So if your child is under five or if they're in middle school or in high school. So there's really something there for everybody. Oh, it's going to work. Hey, Jane, look at this. Katy Perry just kissed a contestant by surprise. Wait, what? Isn't that sexual harassment? I don't know, is it? Yeah, I think it is. I just saw a video about it on a maze. A maze? What is that? Haven't you heard about Amaze? Amaze is this cool website with great videos about sexual health. They talk about puberty, gender identity, menstruation, masturbation, anything you might want to know more about. You can subscribe to the YouTube channel, but be careful. My mom saw me watching one of the videos, and now she watches them even more than I do. <laughs> really? Yep, and old Jim here can't get enough of them either. Generally once a month, an egg is released by an ovary and travels down the fallopian tubes towards the uterus. What? It's interesting. There's even a website for parents and teachers. So come, visit us at youtube.com slash amazeorg or at amaze.org. Parents can follow us on Facebook at Amaze Parents. Bye for now. So that's just an example. And um, the character is one of the characters, uh, her name's Jane, that you see in a lot of the videos. Um, so I thought that was appropriate just to introduce Jane because uh, a lot of people who use this site always talk about what well, Jane said. And I've had students say it to me, but Tracy, Jane said. Um, so just so you're aware of who Jane is. Um, it's an exciting website, it really is. It supports a lot of the work I do. Um, and I find it useful not only as an educator, um, as a community uh, supporter of, you know, teaching sexual health, um, but also as a parent. I have used it for my own um, supports too when talking with my children. So that's the end of our presentation today. Um, if there's anything that you would like to, I'm going to try to stop sharing the screen. Um, and if you'd like to put anything in the chat, that would be great. Um, and hopefully I can answer any questions that you might have.
Well, I don't see any questions in the chat, but thanks. Thank you once again for, for joining uh, me to discuss okay. it. May I ask a question? Yes, a question? you may. Yes, um, I just wondering whether the high school, because I have one son in grade 10, uh, mm -hmm. I just wondering whether the high school provide this course to the students, because I found it's very useful today after I listening to your workshop. Oh, well, thank you. Um, so ju just to be clear, um, I'm sorry, it, I'm having a little trouble. Um, uh, seeing who's speaking though. Our screen is not working, so, so let me um, clarify. So the Relationship in You program is something that I created. Uh, I'm an employee of Community Living Toronto, and if you're interested in having the program for your son um, to attend, you can call, you can email me directly, and I'll try to get back to uh, that screen. But I do, I have been asked by um, educators. So I have been asked, I've done it in a few high schools within the TDSB, and I've done it, this program as a guest in the Catholic high schools as well. So there's two ways that if you want your son to participate in it, you can call me directly uh, and I'll put you on our mailing list when we're gonna be doing our next community program. Um, or you can speak to uh, who's ever teaching them at their high school if they'd be interested in having us come in and teach it um, with their students, then they can also reach out to me at Community Living Toronto. So um, may I have your email address? I will, yes, I'm, I'm trying, yes, it's, I'm trying to get back. Let's see if we can get back to, let's see, let me close this off and hopefully we can, let's see if we can go back. For some reason, let's see here. Okay, let me just go back and I'll put it back up there on the screen. Yep, so there it is right there. It's T O R E G A N at cltoronto.ca. Oh, okay. okay. And you can reach out to me directly. Okay, yeah, thank you, thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Is there anything else? Uh, no. Hi, I had a quick question you were mentioning. Thank you, Tracy. You were mentioning about the game, the poker game. What was the full name? And is this something that we can buy? We can purchase, we can look up and buy? So um, we, it used to be called Partner Poker. Okay, um, and um, there's, I mean, I mean, I hope you appreciate what I showed you is just like a sliver, a sliver of the games and tools that we have. It's not for sale and it's not something I created. So uh, it comes from uh, Public Health in Waterloo. If you, do you have access to email? Uh, yes, I do. You do. So if you email me, it's something that I can send to you for free. So it comes in PDF cards. Excellent, thank you. And that's, that's a resource that we can send right out. And do you recommend that kids play this game uh, by themselves so that they're just that, or you have a... a yeah, you know, that's a really good question. So, and again, my example is just the one way we play it, right? Um, tip, sometimes I've even done it with adults like just typical adults when we're learning about sexual health education and the amount of discussion that you can get out of just one card, you randomly take out one card, right? And the question is, you know, just by what's on their one card, you can say to them, you know, is this something, someone you might be interested in, or is this someone you could be a friend to? So the, the conversation doesn't necessarily have to be about intimacy and sexuality at the beginning, it's about, uh, you know, it's, it's a really great tool too if you're working with people or it's a family member where you're just trying to pull out that little bit of information. Sometimes the little cards can help. So we have used it for just um, to, to lead discussions with if I'm working one-on-one -on -one with someone instead of in a group, but in a group can be a lot of fun, right? And it's, it's just like any kind of group work. You have so many people, sorry about that, you have so many people um, 
providing, you know, different points of view, it becomes really, really hilarious and exciting and interesting. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for that. I can, I can really see where you're going with that and the potential for that, whether it's in relationship or whether it's relationship, friendship or, or family or just in general or however they come. So I really, I think it does. It, the cards can be used in a multitude of way. I mean, like any game, there's rules, but uh, you, we, you know, we adapt it all the time. That's, that's the way our field is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for that. I'm very You're welcome. So please email me and I'll send it to you. I will do. Thank you. Is there any other questions?